so that we could do that. Um, so, um, like I said, we are um, located in La Jolla. We have been, after the shutdown happened, we actually reopened when the governor let retail open back in May. So we have been open to open for business with masks, social distancing. So people that are in the San Diego, La Jolla area can come in and browse and buy books. Um, and also, um, but if tonight we're going to put in the chat both Rachel and Raven's book, so you'll be able to order those directly um, from the chat. You know, I like to say a couple things. If there's any way to get a book, you can get it from an independent bookstore. You don't have to go through um, some of those other channels. So we can get you your books. We can mail them to you. If you live in La Jolla, we'll drive it to your house. But I also like to say that your dollars are like voting and we're in kind of a voting season right now. And if you like an author's book, voting with your dollars and buying their book is letting everybody know that you want that author to buy to write another book. So um, please buy author's books. It's really important. It's important for us, obviously, as booksellers, but it's really important for authors and for you too, Rachel, for your book as well. It's just like, that's the way that, that it lets publishers know that, the, that we want to hear from this author again. So that's my plug on buying books. So anyways, um, there is, there is going to be a way for you to participate in the conversation this evening. So in the chat function, I'll be in the background monitoring that. So if you have any questions for Rachel or for um, Raven in the chat function, you can put those in and we'll bring those in at the end of the conversation. We're going to chat for about 35-ish minutes, so something like that. So, um, and if you're joining us late, you can um, see this video will reside on Facebook and we'll be putting it on our YouTube channel as well. So anyways, with that, and also the premise is a podcast that uh, partnership that we have with Jennifer Thompson. She's actually going to feature this on her podcast as well. So there's lots of uh, good things that'll be happening for this conversation. So with that, I'll get, stop talking. Let me introduce the authors and we'll get on with the, uh, with the program today. So Raven Leilani's work has been published in Grata, The Yale Review, McSweeney's Quarterly Concern, Conjunctions, The Cut, and New England Review, among other publications. Leilani received her MFA from NYU and was an Axon Foundation writer in residence. Lester, we'll do this again, Lester is her first novel. Rachel Kong is a writer living in San Francisco. Her first novel, Goodbye Vitamin, won the 2017 California Book Award for First Fiction and was a Los Angeles Times Book Prize finalist for First Fiction. From 2011 to 2016, she was the managing editor, then executive editor of Lucky Peach Magazine. With Lucky Peach, she also edited a cookbook about eggs called All About Eggs. In 2018, she founded The Ruby, a work and event space for women and non-binary writers and artists in the Mission District. Welcome, both of you. Have a great conversation, and I will see you on the back end. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, this is really, um, thank you, Warwick, for, for having us, and, and thank you, Julie, and thank you, Rachel, for doing this. This is really wonderful. I'm such a fan of you, and I can't uh, see um, who's here watching, but thank you for coming. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Raven. Thank you for writing this amazing book. Um, it was, it's such an honor to do this. I feel like this is such a perfect book for me to read right now. And I think probably so many other people too, um, because it's about so many things, you know, it's about grief, um, which there yes. are of right now and art and uncertainty and it's fun all book that packs a punch and I think yours really does that you know on the sentence level I think just like if you just like pick a sentence, um, they're so beautiful and attention Thank you. There. yeah so I just wanted to start there and say that and encourage everyone to buy the book now if they haven't already. I like a nice compact book. Um, do you that's support, but also just completely <laughs> devastating, which I feel like yours Thank does. You. Um, where did this start for you? Um, it started, I mean, I came in um, to my MFA program and I had a book that I'd written 
uh, before this. And, and I thought that that was going to be the thing I wanted to put into the world um, or the first thing I wanted to put into the world. And then I kind of, I looked, I looked at the project again with new eyes, as you do with some distance. And uh, I kind of just felt that I could, I could, tell a more urgent story, that I could mean it more, that I could be a little more naked on the page. Um, I feel like uh, for me, um, writing, a lot of writing is, is trying to, is being honest about whether or not I'm hiding on the page. And so with this book, it was a kind of, it was a real effort to, to be as candid um, and as like unvarnished as I could in the representation of a black woman's consciousness. Um, and so that's where it started, which was um, how do I, <laughs> how do I write toward um, my, you know, my truth and my discomfort. Um, and Edie kind of, um, she came out of that, out of wanting to kind of be candid about what that, what it feels like to, to want and what it feels like to try and grasp with your craft and, and fail a lot. Yeah, so much about, I think, you know, this drive to mastery yes. of, of doing that um, and about wanting to make art even, um, well, you know, in spite of um, this need to make money and e exist. Um, yeah. I read that there was some life behind that and this novel sort of came together. Yes after work how are how are you writing this book book like practically sure <laughs> I mean that's like, yeah that's really important to me and and definitely kind of like one of the you know um one of the reasons I wrote this book because I was coming from a place like at, when I wrote this book um I was I was in my MFA and I was in the second year the last year and I was also working full-time and I had like a couple small gigs too on the side and that was like, that wasn't unique to my writing. And most of what I've been, I've been trying for five years, five or six years at that point, kind of submitting short stories to literary journals that I really wanted to get into and collecting my rejections, you know, as you do. Um, and when I wrote this book, I, it was very much the same of, of balancing, you know, a full-time job, you know, the thing that um, gave me a roof over my head and, and lights and internet where I could <laughs> write my Google Doc, you know, but also was the thing that um, I had to kind of, I don't know what the right word is, I am, to, to do the private work, the work that wasn't in service of, of paying rent and student debt and the, that, that is, like you said, that's very much in the pages. Um, and it is, I think, in kind of the, you know, in the middle of it, there are so many moments where it feels, um, it feels impossible, you know, and, it, and the work doesn't feel real because it's private and because it isn't, you know, validated by any sort of external, you know, thing or, or legitimized in the way that I really wanted my work could be legitimized, but at the same time, you know, it was real because I was, I was doing it and I was making it. And, um, this book was very much coming from that, you know, what it, what it means to kind of try and sustain that faith, um, in your work, <laughs> um, to claim it. Yeah. That's so powerful because it's, it's really pretty strange. Like why keep doing this thing? <laughs> So yeah. Um, publication, I think, you know, is is also very strange. It's sort of where the art becomes. Yes. Um, this is sort of happening for you for the first time, and yes. I guess have you found um, that um, things have changed? I don't know, like, how do you think about now art in terms of um, being paid money to, to, to make it? It, it's still, <laughs> it still seems a bit surreal, I, I will say, you know, but um, I, like, it is very heartening that 
I could get to a place like with this book um, where like I was just talking about the kind of validation of like having your work witnessed and, and like maybe we all um, by readers or whoever is, you know, connecting with it. And, and I feel that, you know, that, that desire I had. Um, Cause I, I, you know, it's funny I, as I was writing, I, I kind of thought there might be like different writers. There are writers that I think exist where um, uh, they write a thing or they, they make a thing and no one ever has to see it. And, and in some case, like I, you know, I have those projects. I think we all have those projects and I do, I do feel really passionate about the fact that even the work that isn't seen is still really valuable. But I definitely, for a lot to be seen and I want it to be read and um, that it is now, you know, that it, that it is in hands now is, is both surreal, but also kind of an enormous relief, <laughs> you know, um, I, I would say that and um, it is, it is also, it is also strange, like I think that's, you know, what you mentioned about sort of art becoming commodity where it is, it is actual, you know, capital. Like for me, for most of my life, uh, the job, the kind of nine to five I had, that's what that was. And the other thing that I did on the side absolutely was not at all kind of connected to that. So it's, it's interesting and, and strange in a way that they're one, you know, I'm not kind of striving against my kind of main, uh, um, I don't know, main industry in order to do the art, it is the art now and that, that feels extremely lucky. Yeah, it's really amazing and I, um, I love when Edie is at the hospital and she kind of blurts out that she's an artist and then it's <laughs> Um, perhaps. Yes. And, you know, I, I wanted that moment in there because I do think that's like a moment in the world, which is the um, first time when you really kind of mean it or it's, it's an urgent thing that has to be articulated that I you know, and day before the work is You know, and do that right. But I, I believe strongly that as long as you are practicing, it, and then you are that. And for me, I had, you know, um, I actually had a sort of parallel story where I still find and everything happened. And, you know, I had thoracic surgery. Um, and they were theater and they were making small talk and they asked me what I did. <laughs> and at this, at this, you know, at the time I was a editorial coordinator at a scientific journal. And that was what I did, you know, um, with most of my, you know, hours, but I was kind of at night, you know, I was working on my book and that's what I said. I said, I'm a writer, you know? <laughs> and I remember feeling that it, it felt so urgent in that moment um, to articulate it and uh, you know, yeah, I just, I had to get that in the pages. Yeah, that kind of reminds me of how sometimes when these big life changes are happening, like, um, sometimes you need to practice announcing things on people who don't really yes. <laughs> yes. Like, my husband um, told this, like, semi-random stranger when we were engaged, because he was just, like, wanting to test it out, and, <laughs> you know. It's I love that big move and <laughs> so it makes total sense to me and it felt so so real because I think so many people have been there um something else I wanted to talk about just to pivot a little bit is um something that the book does so well is it really um captures a really like specific consciousness and um you know Edie's story is sort of backdropped by um this bigger world and circumstances and context. Yes. And um, really there's so many themes in there. And I think more broadly, that's kind of like what makes a good novel good, you know, just that sort of balance. 
Mm -hmm. um, and there's just this specificity of her voice. Um, but for some reason, people in the book, I think a couple times, you know, want to say um, or want to blame that as blame her wants and her desires as um, or lack of, I think, as characteristic of her generation. Right. <laughs> and she pushes back against that. And I, I really love those moments because um, I think a lot of millennial writers have been there and right a few descriptions of your book as this, you know, quote unquote, millennial novel. And I think Edie would have pushed back against that. Um, so I was, yeah, kind of just wondering what you thought about that. Um, I feel like people still don't get that the reason a good book can feel so universal is that it's so specific. Right. I mean, I have so many thoughts on that. So like for the specificity, and I think, you know, this is actually a thing that maybe a lot of people say, but, you know, when I, when I was teaching, for um, like a little bit last year, uh, that was a thing that we often talked about in, our, in, in the workshop, which was, you know, this idea of coming in with a draft, um, sort of tailored to what you think your audience will want, as opposed to writing toward the private, the really private and specific, that the parts that you feel are um, are unique to you are, are often the parts that another and most magic and you know that recognition in in a shared strangeness um but i do you know i i do feel that this book um is you know if you were to categorize it i, I wouldn't feel um bad to have it be categorized as a millennial novel you know i am one i think there's i can't actually quite figure out if <laughs> Sarah Beatty, I didn't really think, is she exactly a millennial? She might be right on the cusp, you know, but I did write uh, with an understanding of the conventions that already existed and the territory that already been sort of tread. Um, and what I think too is that, you know, around that conversation is a real kind of human inclination um, to to categorize and to to sort um, in a way to make sense of, you know, the people around her are trying to make sense of, of her in a way, you know, um, they've reduced her, you know, deeply um, in this in this sort of uh, effort. But I, I would say that's that's right. I think that their judgments position her rootlessness and her, you know, her desire and her resignation and her rage as a um, well, as a pathology, but also as a symptom of like a sort of uh, disaffected and um, I don't know, soft <laughs> youth, where I would say that when I wrote her, I wanted to speak to the brutality of that. I wanted to speak to the strangeness of, of trying to find your real roots in a world that would, would have you be rootless. What it looks like to search for me when your economy the less human version to survive. Um, and I don't know if I've even articulated that well, you know, but I, I do, when we talk about uh, you know, the, the problems of young people. <laughs> and you know, at, at this point, right, like to be a millennial is like, I forget the bracket is, but like we have children now, you know? Um, but ultimately it is, those are stories about instability. You know, those are stories about trying to find meaning within that instability. And I, I always think that is, um, that's a worthwhile subject. Yeah, oh, there's, so much, there's so much there. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, what you mentioned about categorizing people, that's also, and wanting to categorize her, that's also sort of this like, textbook racism, right? That yes. people get to be individuals and people of color and black people in particular, I think have to represent their group. Right. Like, what Edie is sort of asserting that, no, here, she's a person. And of course she's a product of her environment. And when she was yes. born, everyone in the book, I think something that you do so beautifully is that everyone is so unique and there's, a lot more to them than their descriptions, like on the book jacket, right? Like, <laughs> really contain multitudes. Um, 
And I loved also that Edie's character is so much about contradiction. Like she makes really interesting choices. Yeah. And um, unpredictable, you know, like as a black woman, just kind of walking into her white lover's suburban home. Right. <laughs> I was very freaked out for her. <laughs> And I was wondering, um, yeah, if that was if that was a, a choice that you made to make them so unexpected in this way, and also just what writing characters looks like for you, like if you're just like sitting back and imagining them doing <laughs> things, or if you're making an effort to to sort of go against um, oh, expectation. Totally. I mean, it's a little bit of both because I I, I am definitely a writer where um, I I have to write forward to figure out what it is and if it will work you know like I think my the skeleton like the bones I had for this book when I started out like frequently would change as I got you know I got to page 60 I was like well that's not gonna work you know but um I did like just like I kind of went in understanding that you know the way this book would be contextualized because I'm a millennial and Edie arguably is a millennial I understood like the conventions of of the characters that I kind of that I wanted to involve in this book, you know, like Rebecca, for instance, you know, could have easily been a kind of villainous, jealous suburban wife, you know, um, and I I felt a real responsibility to write against that, you know, to to try and subvert that expectation. Um, more just because I, I do think that's more interesting, but it leaves more it leaves more room for your characters to to be human. You you mentioned contradiction, and I think contradiction is, is human, you know, um, especially it, with Edie, who is a a hungry, desperate character, and so her responses, uh, you know, her responses to her environment, um, you know, the brutality of her environment those are going to be desperate, brutal responses, you know? And, and so I, you know, I wanted to be faithful in um, depicting a character who, you know, and you also mentioned the idea of, you know, what it, the kind of responsibility <laughs> on the page that I think uh, a lot of marginalized writers kind of have to shoulder um, perhaps unfairly uh, in depicting their characters as these perhaps more pristine kind of, um, I don't know, I, I don't want to say caricature because that's a bit harsh, but like I, I really felt that if I were allowed any room to tell this story that it was more important that it be a human character who was able to hold, you know, hold those contradictions and make mistakes and be fallible um, and right, assert her personhood through, through that complexity. Yeah. And Rebecca too, I think, um, was such an interesting character for those reasons as well, just of um, the, the contradictions I think within her. Um, and I was thinking a lot about the, I think there's this, um, I guess I've been reading a couple books like this, but um, there's this sort of convention of like the older woman teaching the younger yeah more messed up women the ways of being mm -hmm. and while that does kind of happen here um i love that you sort of debunk this idea that you become more yourself as you age you know like right yes fully formed person because rebecca is at times a guide but she's also sort of equally fucked up and, yes <laughs> yeah and very much it doesn't really mean that you have your shit all together because Akila, who's the youngest character, yeah, anyways, very mature and, um, you know, very self possessed. Um, yeah. And I think that was just so beautifully done. And I was curious about how you, um, how you approached writing characters at such different stages of life and, um, yeah, if if you felt like all of them in a way. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, if, if that's what you meant, I feel like there's like a little bit of me in, in all of them, even Eric. <laughs> um, but I, 
I did, um, once they were all together and all in play, I will say like I felt deeply intimidated by how to, how to balance those interactions and how to flesh them out in a way that felt archetypical. Um, and you're, you're totally right. I think actually within that house, like Akila is, has like her head most firmly on her shoulders. So like, I would say that that is a symptom of a, of a tragic thing, which is that she is, um, older than she should be because of what she has gone through and is, has great stake in sort of, uh, maintaining the, uh, I don't know, the stability within this house because it's something that she understands is rare and is fleeting. Um, and, you know, I, I also, yes, I also wanted Rebecca to be uh, like fucked up. And because, I mean, honestly, in general, it's, it's more interesting, than, you know, to be able to have something to unpack and have something to, to chew on. But you know, I, I'm obsessed with the idea of, of an unruly woman. And I think we're really in like a wonderful moment with that. You know, I think, um, right now we're in, we're in a real kind of golden moment where, where women are allowed to, to be fucked up, you know, and, and to be dark, uh, and to, you know, and to be human, you know? So that was, that was important to me that, despite the kind of control that I think is, if there's a word to describe Rebecca's character, that would probably be it, um, that there be something you can't particularly anticipate about that character. You know, like I, I thought that would be more fun to kind of keep some things um, a little out of frame. Um, and, and with Edie too, I mean, she's more straightforwardly, um, <laughs> struggling um but those but those struggles are you know those struggles are are human and sort of tethered to to be real and to be affirmed um in her in her craft and in her personhood um so ultimately like when i was writing the characters um i really did my best to to write in a way that felt non-judgmental um and that made room um, for their responses to be, you know, rational, um, byproducts of, of them kind of trying to seek whatever it is each kind of respective character is trying to seek, seek out. Yeah, and there's just so much generosity, I think, in the way that you approached each of these characters' desires, and, um, at times, you know, just reactions, I think, you know, you mentioned Rebecca wanting to assert control and Edie sort of acting out the way that she does. I mean, and Akila in her own way too. I think all of them seem to be um, doing what they could in response to a sort of powerless situation that they were yes. in. Um, I wondered if you could, yeah, talk a little bit more about what you're thinking about um, with power in this book and, and power dynamics. Sure, I mean, I think, the, the book kind of starts out um, immediately kind of plugged into that, um, I don't know if what the right word is, but you know, we see Edie on this date with, with Eric and what is exciting about this is that real discrepancy um, of, of, of power between them. And you know, it's, it's, it was tricky and, um, and fun to, to write a, a black woman who is, you know, who is subject to, you know, her violence in the public realm and reduction in the public realm and, and generally kind of in, inhabits a, like a chronic powerlessness in, in, on many fronts and what that looks like for her to invite that privately and to enjoy that privately. You know, I thought that, um, uh, I wanted, yeah, I just, I wanted kind of deeply to write about that friction. And so that's sort of where we start off, which is a powerless, um, generally a powerless character, even though in, within sex, when I wrote like the, the, the sex scenes, like it was important for me in those moments for her to be a person who um, asserts 
And for me as an, an author, I make room on the page to allow a woman to um, kind of inhabit her desire without judgment. Um, but, you know, so the power is kind of like, I think how it even, how it even begins. And then as we moved, you know, you know, as I continued to write, what started to interest me more was those power fluctuations between these two women who are, um, who are very different, you know, <laughs> who are, who are coming from very different lived experiences. You know, Rebecca is, um, you know, she's comfortable and she is more fixed um, and, and more established um, and also, you know, deeply more in control. Her hand is in this arrangement is, is kind of overt from the very beginning. She's a little bit always in the background. Um, and Edie is like kind of careening out of control and in a way that is, a way that is sort of like, beyond her control that isn't an, an, you know a result of this you know what is structural um but also in a way that she is embracing and kind of leaning into um and sort of seeking out a kind of annihilation uh and so in bringing those two characters together one uh, one character who is uh controlling her variables and another who um you know walks into her lover's house <laughs> <laughs> and 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 feels the lemons. I, I that was really those that was really fun to to play around with, um, and to kind of get to watch that power oscillate wildly between these two poles. Um, and I do think that is partly why that you know that relationship between Rebecca and Edie begins to feel erotic <laughs> is because of that power component. Um, I was, I forget who I was talking to, and, and I think this is actually like a, uh, like a real um, kind of uh, standard thing when you're talking about sex, but like the good, like good sex on the page as in like not good sex, like good depictions of sex are often kind of underpinned um, with these oscillations of power. And so that too was, you know, I knew I wanted to write a book that, um, <laughs> you know, that didn't pan away and that allowed two bodies or three bodies or however many bodies to, um, to be awkward and strange and, um, you know, unvarnished and tender. You know, I knew that power too would be kind of that, that ingredient that I would want to play with in those moments. Yeah, and there's also, I think, I was thinking a lot about just the power um, in your own life as I, as, as I was reading it. And I was thinking, you know, that I really didn't want to go, I mean, I really wouldn't want to go back to who I was when I was 23 and, and yeah. <laughs> see that, uh, see Edie. <laughs> um, and, but it, at the same time also made me like mourn some aspects of that existence, right? Like how alive she is to the world and how observant and passionate. Yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, I was thinking about just how I think um, the different characters in the book are almost, they could also sort of represent um, a single person in, in different stages of, of their life. Yes, totally. I love that. I really love that. <laughs> yeah, and, and just that, you know, no stage is more correct than the other. Um, and I was wondering, actually, I was thinking also about this in terms of, like, just the novel itself and, and writing a book. And I really love the final page of the book and was, um, and I don't think it spoils anything, but I was wondering if you could read just the last page of the book beginning with, um, so I've tried to reproduce an inscrutable thing. Totally. And thank you for saying that, because I mean, I'm sure you, you know, know what I mean, but like that last page is always like, how do I, <laughs> you know? Um, it was a mic drop. So good. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I've tried to reproduce an inscrutable thing. I've made my own hunger into a practice made everyone who passes through my life subject to a close and inappropriate reading 
that occasionally finds its way, often insufficiently, into paint. And when I am alone with myself, this is what I am waiting for, someone to do to me, with merciless, deliberate hands, to put me down into the canvas so that when I'm gone, there will be a record, proof that I was here. That's so good. Thank you. <laughs> you know, was, that really resonated with me because I was thinking just about, you know, this, this moment that we're all in and how time feels so stationary, but at the same time, it's, it's really not, you know, things are changing and, and we are, time is passing, we're getting, yeah. um, and writing a novel is so interesting because it's like trying to capture this specific moment um, when life isn't stationary, writing isn't stationary. Right. So I think um, that inscrutable thing, you know, is life itself and so hard to render. And I was wondering, um, well, first what you were thinking of when you were writing that last page and also just how does it feel now to have the book be a stationary, like solid thing in your hands? I mean, as I was writing that, you know, I was, I was thinking about, you know, I was thinking about a couple of things about what it is, you know, to be a writer or a painter or, or anyone who is trying to replicate, you know, I don't know, replicate tenderly, um, sort of accurately their reality. Um, and it is, it is, it's kind of, it's like a merciless art, <laughs> you know, and it's one that, that both, that both kind of unites you with your environment and also distances you, you know, and, and you feel that in, in Edie, you know, the way that she's studying and the way she's calculating. And some of that is due to, you know, her being a black woman, but I, I was thinking a lot about what it, like your relationship to the world, you know, when you were trying to um, kind of distill it into something that makes sense, you know, into something concrete and what that means to like, to make a record and to also be, be much like that, a thing that is witnessed and seen, especially if you are an artist and, you know, your kind of art and craft depends on you not you being kind of invisible in a way, you know, invisible in a way that makes it, you know, so that you can study. Um, and so I was kind of speaking to that, um, I don't know, that, that quandary. Um, and it is, uh, you know, I, I did settle on the fact that, you know, I do think that one of the reasons we, we make art is to, is to assert our reality and to feel affirmed that it is real. And um, and definitely, you know, Edie, Edie wants that and I think is heading towards that. Um, and to, to, you know, so that to feel my book, you know, have it be a real thing in the world is, it's like, it'll never ever get old. It just is the coolest, most insane thing. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> it was such a great, I think this is a good place to kind of, you know, bring in some questions from the audience and, and to just, uh, I could think we could go on, you two could go on and talk all night. <laughs> I could listen to you all night, that's for sure. Uh, I adored, I adored this book. And I mean, it was one of those, like I said in the blurb that I put in it, it's just like anybody out there who hasn't read it yet, just give your block of time and just devour this book in one long gulp because it is just fantastic. It is so good. So anyways, we have some questions from the audience. <laughs> um, one is from, um, let's see, let's go back here for a second. Cassandra, Cassandra says, congratulations on your success. Brooklyn born here, she says. Um, but she'd like to, and she's so excited to get the book, but she's wondering, is there, did you go sign books anywhere? Is there any signed books oh, around yeah. the Brooklyn area that she can go by? So, I mean, I, I hope that, like, I hope they might be, you know, gone, because I, I, I they're they're, gone it's been a while. Years. Like, I signed, I signed at Greenlight, um, okay. in Prospect Leffert. I signed at, um, Center for Fiction, um, and, uh, yeah, I think those are, and books are magic. I signed okay. at those three. And Excellent. I'm not sure they, but I, I keep, like, I kind of pop in every now and then, so. <laughs> it's always fun I to see them. your book on the shelf, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the good things about it. It's just like, oh, it's in the wild there. <laughs> and then um, 
Christine is asking, what authors have inspired you? Oh, um, I really, really love um, Otessa Mashve. Um, I love uh, Mary Gates Gill. Um, I love Tony K. Pumbara, uh, uh, Zadie Smith. Um, I really, God, I really dig. Hmm. I mean, like, what books are I like, reading now or what books have influenced me? Because, um, like, probably, or what you're reading now, like, during the, okay. the both, so, of you, both of you could answer that question. It's like, what have like, you been reading? There are an incredible amount of books that have come out. Like, I feel like it's actually been, like, a very big year for, for books. Um, one book that I, I really, really love, um, Alexander Chang, Days of Distraction, um, A House is a Body by mm -hmm. Shruti Swami. Um, I really... Uh, Dig Transcendent Kingdom by uh, Yasi, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think, yeah, I think I'll, those are, yeah, those are. <laughs> yeah. Rachel, what have you been reading during the shutdown? I mean, um, like, I'm just echoing Raven, there's so much good stuff out right now. And especially during a pandemic, it's like, why couldn't this happen any other year? It just seems like there are so many good books that came out this year. It's just crazy. Of all time. Um, I also love Shruti's book. She's a friend of mine. But right now I'm reading um, Jane Smiley's 13 Ways of Looking at a Novel, which she actually wrote, like, I think after 9-11. And she wrote while she was stuck on a book herself, like just having terrible writer's block. And... Um, yeah, I've been really loving it because it's um, super nerdy. She just talks about all of these novels that she likes or has learned from a hundred of these novels and she lists them all and, and they really range. They're pretty Western though, which is the one, one negative, but yeah, it's, it's really good. I'm not, not done with it yet, but um, it's kind of helping me get through, push through. Maybe a slight block of my own. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then Carol um, says she's super excited to read the book. What did it look like when you started writing it? How did you start it? So what was it? Was it the like the beginning process? Uh, I just, it really was the, the project that I was writing before it. Um, it just didn't pan out. I, I looked at it and I had to be honest with myself, which was hard. <laughs> and I, you know, I had to put it away and I started something new and in terms of like the logistics, you know, I wrote it um, after I came from work and after I came from class and then I kind of would have those night hours where I would kind of bang out as many pages as I could, um, as, as much as I could per week, you know, I, I just wasn't like I, every seven days a week at like exactly 8 p.m., you know, it was really just where I could um, and uh, yeah, I just kind of worked on it for a little bit over a year. Um, and yeah, I mean, that that's like the whole thing. But how I began was basically um, how the last project ended. <laughs> I guess. It's like, it's always, that's always the hard part looking at that blank page. Um, so that's about it. Yeah. I know that um, we're running out of time here. So I just want to conclude with a couple things. Rachel, what are you working on next? Do we have anything new coming from you in the future? or near future, I should say. I'm um, just writing my next book and I've been, I've been writing it for a while now, um, but it's not, there's no publication date. It's like a little bit far from that, but I am like Edie, just groping around in the <laughs> dark. <laughs> so if people want to follow you or hear your thoughts on anything, what's a good way for people to, to be in touch with you uh, via social media? Well, they can find me on Twitter or Instagram. I don't really tweet. I only occasionally Instagram. So um, that's that's just where they can find me. Yeah. So they just have to be patient until that next book comes out. <laughs> and Raven, I know that we're talking about a book that just came out, but everybody <laughs> always wants to know, what are you working on next? <laughs> you know, um, I, I haven't written anything. <laughs> and I, I think uh, maybe in the new year, I'll probably be begin um, work on, on my next project but for now it's it's all Lester <laughs> yes it's and then speaking of let's talk about the let's talk about the title 
Were you involved with the title? Was this always the working oh, title? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's funny. It's I mean, that this comes up occasionally, and then I think of I forget what the title used to be. Um, but I know that when I was working on this, I was workshopping it. You know, parts of it, the parts that I felt like okay to show people, and um, that was one of the biggest comments, like most consistent comments, was this title is horrible. Like, do something about it. And so then, then we found Lester. You know, I <laughs> worked with my editor, my editor, and I sent her like sixty different titles, and and this was the one where it, when it came, it was like, okay, I think this is right. <laughs> She's fantastic, by the way. <laughs> She's so wonderful. She's so good. Yeah. So, and people follow you, Twitter, Instagram. What do you, what do, you, what do you show? I think you have had a great. You, you do put a lot of your artwork on your Instagram page, don't yeah. you? Yeah, yeah, that's so. mostly what it is. Um, so you can reach me on, on Twitter. Um, it's like just Raven Leilani and, and same with Instagram. I think there's like an underscore. I think there's another Raven Leilani out there who got the, 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 you know, the, <laughs> the other one. Um, but yeah, it's just Raven Leilani anywhere. Yeah. And your, it's your artwork on your Instagram is fantastic. So Thank again, you. everybody, if you haven't read this book, pick it up. You, it is just, it is one of those books of the ages um, for anybody. It's, such a great book it was such a great read just loved it so um i'm so excited that you were able to join us i know you've got to go rachel thank you so much for being here with us we're going to say good night to facebook and thank you thank you Warwick, and thank you rachel <laughs> good night bye